Sal Vuete. Welcome back to Weekly Roman History, where we look at the whole story of Rome one step at a time. This week, we're going to talk about the structure of the Roman Republic, because it will be impossible to follow some of the story that follows without knowing how the government works. My sources for this video are mainly secondary. The two big ones are Ancient Rome, A Military and Political History by Christopher S. McKay, and The Romans from Village to Empire by Mary T. Boatwright et Ali. In the last video, Rome expelled its final king, Tarquinius Superbus, because of his tyranny. The system of government they set up in the Republic period shows a paranoia about tyranny. Everything about the government is designed to avoid one person gaining too much power for too long. Some principles of the offices in the Republic. Election. This is a big obvious one. Officials are elected by assemblies of the people. No gaining power by force or intrigue, as some did in the monarchy. Magistrates call the assemblies and propose the items to be voted on. There is no discussion or debate. Only the magistrates write the laws. Only the magistrates have the legal right to speak at the assembly. Although, in practice, heckling was very common, and riots were another way for people to show their displeasure. Voting is done by units. Each assembly is subdivided, and each unit gets one vote. The centuriate assembly is the one that decides the most important stuff. They vote for the officers with imperium, decide if Rome goes to war, and judge capital legal cases. Voting in the centuriate assembly is done by wealth brackets, and the more money you have, the fewer people in your century. Which means that even though every male citizen has one one vote, your vote means proportionally more if you are rich than if you are poor. They also let the rich centuries vote first and stop asking as soon as they get over 50%, so the poorest centuries literally wouldn't vote most of the time because their vote no longer mattered. There was voting, but this certainly wasn't an equitable representative democracy. Collegiality. With one major exception, all offices in the Republic are held by more than one person at a time. If one magistrate wants to do something and his colleague or colleagues don't agree, then he cannot take that action. It's a system that favors inaction and the status quo. In case of disagreement, no action will be taken. The idea that every officeholder has others with the same level of power that can serve as a check on his behavior is one of the Republic's biggest safeguards against tyranny. It was also a big influence on the theory of checks and balances that later guided the Founding Fathers constructing the U.S. Constitution. One-year terms. Generally, offices begin and end on January 1st. A magistrate serves for one year, and then is replaced. There were different rules about re-election during different eras. Sometimes a magistrate simply couldn't be elected for an office in the next year. Sometimes it was 10 years, and sometimes everyone disregarded all such limits. Immunity. While in office, no magistrate can be prosecuted for a crime. If they do something illegal, all legal action against them has to wait until they're out of office, which will be at the end of the year. The idea was probably to protect office holders from legal harassment by political opponents looking to waste their limited time in office, but the opportunities for abuse are obvious. A few more concepts to know before we dive into the officers. Pomerium. The pomerium is a sacred boundary around the city of Rome. No one can build anything that straddles the pomerium. Everything has to be either inside it or outside it. And there's a clear separation between what magistrates are allowed to do inside and outside the pomerium. Outside the pomerium, their power is much freer. Within the sacred boundaries of the city, there are important restrictions that protect citizens from their rulers. Imperium. The word comes from imperare, to order or command. Imperium means power, but it has a very specific application in government. To have imperium means you can make decisions with life and death stakes. Primarily, you can judge in legal disputes and you can lead armies, because both courts and wars kill Romans. The symbol of imperium is the fasces, which I mentioned a few weeks ago as one of the Etruscan symbols of power supposedly brought to Rome by Tarquinius Priscus. A fasces is a bundle of rods with an axe sticking out, which represents the absolute power of a monarch. The sticks represent their power to build, and the axe their power to destroy. The king had been accompanied by twelve lictors, a kind of ceremonial guard, and each lictor would be carrying a fasces. After the fall of the monarchy, the Romans modified the fasces to suit the symbolism of their new leaders, and gave magistrates different amounts of lictors to indicate the amount of power they had. There are two kinds of imperium, which are represented by different fasces. Outside the pomerium, i.e. commanding an army, magistrates have imperium militii, or command of the military. This power, while not truly unlimited, is effectively unlimited. Commanders can act toward non-Romans pretty much however they see fit. Those wielding Imperium Militii have fasces with axe heads, as you see in the picture. Inside the Pomerium, magistrates have Imperium Domi, or command at home. This is the limited sort of power which has checks that protect citizens' rights. 
Those wielding Imperium Domi have Phosgase with the axes removed, because their power to destroy is somewhat circumscribed. Note that the two kinds of Imperium are purely based on where one is executing the power. A magistrate receives Imperium, and must act with restraint when inside the city, but has absolute authority outside of it. Sidebar on the Phosgase. The Phosgase survived into the modern day as a symbol of power. Latin students everywhere should take note of the Fosgays that decorate the Speaker's podium in the U.S. House of Representatives. Early American politicians were eager to draw comparisons between their new republic and the Roman Republic, which was the last prestigious example of a non-monarchical government in the world history up to that point. Personally, I think the symbolism would work better if they used the Fosgays without the axes, which would better reflect the U.S.'s stated ideals of limited government and the rule of law. But they would be harder to recognize as Fosgays like that. A more unfortunate modern application can be found in the word fascism, which derives from the word phosgase. Fascism believes in investing absolute power in one person, so the Roman symbol of unchecked power is appropriate for such a belief. These two applications should give you a glimpse into the complicated legacy of Roman history, the high ideals of the early American Republic, and the reactionary politics of a group who believe in totalitarianism, both wrapped up in the same symbol. So, as I told you in the last video, the chief magistrates of the Republic are called consuls. There are two at a time, like our first consuls, Brutus and Collatinus. Since, like most offices, they serve for one calendar year, January 1st to January 1st, the Romans described their years by who was consul in that year. They didn't have a sequential numbering system for years like we do, so they said a phrase like in the consulship of Brutus and Collatinus instead of 509 BCE. Under the consuls is a range of offices that form a sort of hierarchy that in later eras is solidified into what is called the cursus honorum. Candidates had to serve in the lower offices before moving up. Reaching the consulship was the highest honor for any Roman man, and aristocratic families were very competitive about how many of their members had been consul, so high-class Roman boys were raised with the clear expectation that they were to climb the cursus honorum and immense pressure would have been applied throughout their education to prepare them for the realities of politics. Immediately under the consul in the Cursus Honorum is the Praetor, which we know didn't exist until a little later in our story, the 4th century BCE. The praetors assisted the consuls and had authority to do consular duties when the consuls were not available, a bit like a vice president, except actually useful. They exist solely because Rome develops a need for more than two people at once to have imperium. As it becomes the norm for consuls to spend their entire year outside Rome on campaign with the army, praetors assume the duties the consuls leave behind in Rome. And as Roman territory expands and more commanders with imperium are needed for the army, more praetors are added. First there are two, then they move to alternating years of four and six at a time. Under the praetors are the aediles, who are in charge of public things, especially temples, marketplaces, roads, baths, games, and the grain dole. You know, infrastructure. There are four aediles at a time, and some do have a very limited form of imperium. Under the aediles are the quaestors, whose role changed a lot through the eras. Originally there were two, one to assist each consul, but more were added. At the most well-recorded part of the Republic, there were twenty at a time, and they acted primarily as financial officers in the treasury in the Temple of Saturn. Quaestors do not have imperium. The quaestorship is the typical entry point for an aristocrat into the Cursus Honorum, though a young man would have been expected to serve some years as a military tribune before taking it on. A non-aristocratic Roman climbing the Cursus Honorum would be more likely to start as a tribune of the plebs. The tribune is a later addition, and I will go into that process in the next video. The original function of the tribune was to serve as a voice for the common man. Rome is an oligarchy, and the people sometimes need protection from the ruling class. Tribunes have the power of veto. Veto is Latin for I forbid. A tribune had the ability to halt the action of any other magistrate for any reason, as a way of protecting the people. And though there were many tribunes at a time, two at first, but there came to be many more, one tribune's veto was enough to bring all public business to a halt. Importantly, a tribune can only act in the city. Outside the Pomeria, magistrates do not need to fear their vetoes. In the early stages of the Republic, the aristocracy and the people were frequently at odds, and the tribunes were the people's representatives. But the Republic changed, partially because of the tribune's power, and the oligarchy came to include many plebeians. Eventually, the tribunes were reliable members of the new nobility, and wound up the chief law writers of Rome. Now we come to some stranger offices. The censors are in charge of taking the census, as their name suggests. If you remember, the census was not just a count of the citizens, but a way to assess wealth and social standing for the purposes of taxing and recruiting for the military. After a while, the censors also take it upon themselves to maintain the list of senators, and they are able to remove people from the Senate if their 
morals are not up to standard. This role of enforcing the moral code of the upper class gives us the modern meaning of the word censor. Unlike the other offices we've talked about, censors are not yearly because the census is not needed every year. Two censors are appointed every five years, and they have a year and a half to do the census because it's an intensive process. Censors are chosen from the list of former consuls, and though the job itself is not as prestigious as the consulship, it is a feather in an ex-consul's cap to have been so esteemed by his peers. In times of need, Rome would appoint the one magistrate whose powers were unlimited, the dictator. The word dictator has negative connotations today, but it didn't in ancient Rome. If the traditional chain of command fails, if a military emergency arises and the consuls are both far away or just not good enough for the job, a consul or the senate could appoint a dictator. The traditional means is for the consul to ceremonially appoint the dictator in the middle of the night. The dictator then has absolute power to lead the army and do whatever else is needed to deal with the emergency. A dictator is the only magistrate whose fosces have the axes in them within the pomerium, because in such an emergency he has unlimited power even inside the city. If there are consuls or other magistrates on hand, they are now subordinate to the dictator, though the dictator gets to choose his own second-in-command, who goes by the name Magister Equitum, or Master of the Horsemen. Dictators are typically appointed for a term of six months, which is the only legal check on their power. If a dictator chooses, he can rule as a tyrant, but only until his six months are up. He can also choose to give back his power early if he resolves the problem in less than six months, which is what he is supposed to do. The best way to tell you about dictators is to tell you about the model dictator, Cincinnatus, who served in 458 BCE. Lucius Quinctius Cincinnatus had been an important noble in Rome. He'd been consul, he'd been an excellent military commander, the whole deal. But his adult son got on the wrong side of a political conflict and wound up exiled. And the whole incident not only put a smear on Cincinnatus, but also all but bankrupted him. So he lives on a tiny farm across the Tiber in an unfashionable area of the Janiculum Hill. But then an Italian people called the Aequi break a treaty with Rome and march on the city. One of the consuls is defeated and besieged on the road to the city. The other is too far away to help. The Senate chooses Cincinnatus dictator and sends a group of senators to go tell him. These senators find Cincinnatus plowing his field. They tell him to go put his toga on, and he knows it has to be serious. He gets his wife to bring him his toga and tries to clean up a little. And once he's suitably dressed, they hail him as dictator. He puts together an army in a single day, then marches off and defeats the Aequi and rescues the consul who is surrounded. Then he goes back to Rome, resigns his command, and goes right back to his plow. Of the six months he was given to solve the problem, he is dictator for only 15 days. Cincinnatus is our example of what a dictator is supposed to be in the Roman imagination, a moral man who can take charge when he is needed and steps back away when he isn't. He is also the model of what a good Roman was supposed to be in the early Republic. The Roman ideal was the soldier farmer, who leaves his plow to fight for his country and returns to it without seeking more. It is the ideal of Cincinnatus that George Washington aspired to when he gave up the presidency after two terms. He wanted to go back to his farm as soon as his work was done, and wanted future presidents to do the same. There's a statue of Washington as Cincinnatus in the Smithsonian Museum, wearing a Roman-style toga and handing back his sword as Cincinnatus hands back his fosques. Sorry to keep bringing things back around to U.S. history. That might be annoying if you're watching this outside the U.S. It's just that our founding fathers really kinned the Roman Republic, so the imagery is all over the place here. I mean, we have a city in Ohio named Cincinnati. Dictators seem to have been pretty common in the early Republic, but the office was used less and less as the Romans added magistrates with Imperium. More people with Imperium means less of a chance for the city to be left defenseless with no one who can legally lead an army. The office made a roaring comeback in the late Republic as Rome spun toward autocracy, but that's a story for another day. A giant presence looming over all of this is the Senate. The Senate started as an advisory council to the king, and continues as an advisory council to the consuls and other magistrates, but it gets deeper than that. Its members are drawn from the pool of former office holders, until at a certain point all former office holders join the Senate. The Senate goes from a 300-person body to a massive network of powerful former and future consuls. A king could disregard the Senate if he wished, but a consul wouldn't dare go against it or diminish its power, and not only because these are the men he most respects. A Roman is consul for a year, and depending on when he lives, might get the privilege one or two more times, or most likely never again. After his term of office is over, he'll spend the rest of his life in the Senate. It's to his advantage to preserve the Senate's standing. So while the Senate has no official powers, it's not a legislative body as most modern Senates are, it has enormous influence. The Senate's approval is needed at different times for all sorts of things to be legal, but its most important role is as a reservoir of experience and influence. This brings us to our primary source quote for today. 
Senatus Populusque Romanus, which is more often seen abbreviated as SPQR. It means the Senate and the people of Rome, and it's really less of a quotation and more of a general purpose slogan that appears on coins and public buildings and such. We don't really know who coined the phrase or exactly when it first appeared, but it showed up during the Republic. SPQR describes the sovereign power of the Republic. No one individual, but the Senate and the people, speaking as one. The modern city of Rome still uses SPQR. You'll see it on lamp posts and manhole covers over there. Now here's the thing. The system as I've just described it is the system of the middle to late Republic, from the 3rd to the 1st centuries BCE. Roman historians like Livy would have you believe that the Romans set up the consulship immediately after expelling Tarquin in the 6th century BCE, and most of the rest of this system pretty quickly thereafter. That's obviously pretty unlikely. A system of this complexity doesn't get invented in a few years. It evolves slowly over a very long time. Rome wasn't built in a day, so to speak. But because Roman historians tended to project conditions in their own times backward onto historical people, we don't know how the government of the early Republic worked. Mary Beard, one of the preeminent modern-day scholars of ancient Roman history, argues convincingly that Rome, after the abolition of the monarchy, probably had no set government, but was instead ruled by whatever warlords could amass large enough private armies. This actually seems to have been the norm for most archaic Italian societies, influential families with private forces fighting each other for dominance. At a certain point, however, Rome started to move away from rule by force and toward rule by law. It is suggested by Boatwright et al. E. that Rome's pivot from private armies to a state-run army might be one of the prime factors that explain its eventual dominance over the rest of Italy. If this is the case, then the families who gained power by force and then wrote that power into law also established traditions that said that their power had always been legal and orderly, and that's what later historians had to work with. Whatever the case, this complex system of consuls and praetors and tribunes and senators and occasional dictators serves Rome for at least a few centuries, even if it probably isn't as old as the Romans think it is. One change is certain and well documented, however. What begins as a rule by a privileged few gets slowly but surely more democratic. I will begin that story in our next video. It's patricians versus plebeians in the conflict of the orders. Down with the oppressors.